understanding sleeper distributions in coastal environments. So uh, just to, get it, to make sure I don't forget anyone, this has been uh, a very sort of long project of mine. So I started at the start of my PhD in 2011 in Aberdeen, uh, and I was helped with that with, by Marine Scotland. Um, and then since moving here, I've worked increasingly with the Sea Watch Foundation, um, and their support has been invaluable. Um, and the past few years, this work has also been funded by, by various uh, groups here, so NERC, EPSRC, Assemble Plus, Primary, and now the BES. So, uh, you know, this is, I find these talks very useful because usually at a conference talk, you've got 50 minutes and you talk about one project or, or one paper. And these talks, it's nice because you bring all together, you sort of, your, your whole research and start to look at the bigger picture. So hopefully that's what I've done today. Um, so I'm first going to introduce the coastal environments in general. <laughs> This would be quite a fluffy introduction, but basically why I find them interesting and uh, why I choose to, to uh, study these areas. And then I'm going to go through um, some of the processes which I've been working on, so which influence seabird distributions in these habitats, so tides and topography, the first one. And then um, I'm starting to look increasingly on the impact of uh, weather on seabirds as well. And then just a, a summary at the end to bring together these two topics. So with regards to coastal environments, I, I guess... Uh, not to be too sentimental, but it's where we, we first experience the marine environment. Uh, it's very accessible. So for me, being from the Midlands in, in, in the UK, uh, I have very fond uh, memories of going to the coastline um, in summer holidays. This is where I first got to experience marine life, it's where I first got to see seabirds. Uh, so it's got a very special, special place for me. But also I find it fascinating because it's such a diverse habitat. So these are some pictures of some, on some of the sites I have uh, studied or studying. And you'll see here that even in this very, this very narrow interface between the terrestrial environment and the marine environment, you get a huge diversity of habitats. So they can be quite exposed, uh, very windy, lots of waves, can be very calm and sheltered and quite shallow. Um, you can get very strong currents in some areas, very slow currents in, in others. Uh, and this bottom left seems a bit of an odd one. This is some field work I did in the Azores last summer. And this is the, the really big swells coming in off the uh, central Atlantic. So it's not only, you know, a very fun place for me, but it's also a place where you can, you can study lots of different habitats in such a small area and see how this affects uh, bird life. And because of this diversity in, in, in habitats, these areas tend to attract a huge variety of birds. So you tend to get a mixture of, of, of a coastal species um, with the occasional inf influx of more offshore species. So this is just a sort of um, example of the species we get around Anglesey. So we get things like uh, northern gannets in the top left here, uh, we get the more offshore species, so this is the, the northern fulmer, the top right. Uh, puffins are here all year round, guillemots, razor bills, uh, quite a lot of gull species. This is a uh, pretty gull called a kittiwake. Um, terns as well, which is, you'll see on all the coastal path signs, because uh, it's quite an quite a iconic bird. Uh, and we also get lots of manx shearwaters in the summer as well. So, so the, these areas bring together a huge variety of, of bird species. So in combination, we've got very diverse habitats very diverse uh, bird life and a uh, chance to address some really interesting questions. But also, um, to, to get to the serious point, these, these habitats are very exposed to, um, sorry, very uh, vulnerable to environmental change. So this can occur primarily through two means. You've got the sort of um, direct human activities. So uh, I'm talking about hard infrastructure. So uh, marine renewable energies are one. Uh, coastal developments or another, so things which actually change the physical environment. And on top of that, we've also got the obviously the impact of um, environmental change. So for this talk, I'm going to focus on, on wind and uh, precipitation, so rainfall. But um, you can basically split these, these threats into these two broad categories. Um, and this will hopefully link into the two processes that I'm going to talk about um, in a minute. So... That's why I study coastlines, and that's why I find it an interesting uh, study system. So what I'm going to go through now is, is the sort of two main research areas which I'm working on at the moment. Uh, one, um, I started with a PhD, so looking at tides and to, uh, topography, and the second one, weather, is something which I've only just started to, to um, look into, um, and I'll explain why this, this has happened um, uh, when I get to that section. So this is a, a very nice uh, image provided by Peter Robbins at Seacams, uh, sorry, at, uh, uh, from Seacams Project, showing um, the tides around uh, North Wales. So obviously tides have, have several aspects to them. The first one is the is the, the change in height, so between low tide and high tide. But you also get 
this change in current speed and current direction. So you'll see there, it's lack tide, um, slow currents, increases towards the peak tidal flows, and then back again down to slack tide. So you've got this, this very uh, dynamic system with, with changes in tidal height, but also changes in tidal direction um, and, and um, speed of currents. But aside from that, you've also got the inference of uh, topography. So this is an image from Point Linus uh, on North Anglesey, which sort of shows how, how complex these coastlines can be. So you'll see here there's, there's, there's a big, big variety in the complexity of coastlines. But also as well, when I talk about topography, I'm talking about the uh, seabed as well. So changes in depth um, and slopes, um, sandbanks, troughs, uh, etc. So you've got this, this, uh, these two, two factors, so the, the tides and, and changes in seabed depth and, and um, coastal complexity, which in combination are really important in shaping the um, physical environment around coastlines. So what I'm going to do now is just go through some of the features that we tend to get. So this is, and I'm polished any um, oceanographers in the room because I've perhaps oversimplified things here, but this is a very typical scenario where you get uh, fast currents in uh, shallow water, slow currents in deep water. And what this leads to is a pattern in uh, the tendency for uh, stratification. So typically where it's shallow wind and fast currents, you get mixed water. So very similar properties across depths. And the further offshore you get, in deep water and slow water, you tend to get um, vertical uh, stratification, so different physical and chemical properties at the surface to the seabed. And typically then, between these two um, bodies of water, you tend to get tidal fronts. So this is the, the point where the mixed water meets the stratified water, and the, and the front forms in between these two water masses. And you typically get quite... Um, sort of complex and circular currents in these areas. This again is a very simplistic um, representation of this, but this is where you have uh, quite flat seabeds, so you get laminar currents, so not much going on. But as soon as you put in a bit of, uh, bit of complex seabed, you tend to get circular currents and more complex currents. And to go on a bit more, this is a bit more complex situation, but you can get fast currents interacting with, with, with a steep slope. And this creates um, very turbulent currents, and you get this complexity in, in the um, in turbulence and current speeds. Conversely, you can go over a slope, and this time you get um, turbulent currents on the seabed. And this is a very typical one in a um, coastal environment where you get fast currents interacting with an island or a headland. You get the fast currents accelerating around the edge, and in the wake of this, you get slow currents. And then in between these two water masses, you get quite a prominent shear line. And this is shown by, by sort of quite choppy and white water. And it's very clear um, on, on a calm day, especially. So you get all these different interactions between currents and uh, topography. And this leads to like a, a sort of mosaic um, pattern in, in quite a lot of these coastal habitats. So you, you tend to see patches of calm water, of choppy water, of fast water, slow water. And you get this very nice sort of, as I said, sort of mosaic of different um, habitats characterised by very different physical properties. So this is a, a site I worked on in Orkney, which I'll go on to in a minute. And here you can see these very prominent shear lines um, coming off the, the islands and headlands. This is a bit closer. This is at uh, Penmon Point. This is where you get fast currents interacting with a, a steep slope on, on the seabed. You get quite choppy currents. Uh, there's some... Uh, boils there, etc. So, you, so these habitats are really physically complex. And in terms of um, impacts from, uh, so from human, uh, sorry, in terms of impacts, the main impacts here typically tend to be from human uh, uh, structures. So, uh, marine renewable energies and coastal development. So, again, perhaps oversimplifying this, this is your um, typical situation before you put a structure in. You put a turbine in and suddenly you get a lot more going on. So the um, structure itself can lead to energy dissipation, so the release of energy from through turbulent motions. But also, obviously, if this is a tide turbine or wind turbine, it's actually taking energy out of that um, system. So you do get these very profound changes when you put in physical um, uh, structures. And this is some work that's been done by um, Michaela at uh, 
which is at Proudman Labs in Liverpool, and Pierre down at PML, showing that the impacts of, of this change, so this, this, uh, the impacts of, of this energy dissipation and energy, energy extraction can have very sort of clear impacts both on the near field and the far field. So obviously the main impact is going to be um, on the near field. As you can see here, this is changes, predicted changes in current speed in the Pentland Firth, so in Orkney, around an array of turbines. But also it can have very subtle changes in, in, in the far field. So this is what Pierre did. Uh, and this is based on wind farms, I think, in the Irish Sea, having an impact on tides in the southern North Sea. So it might be more subtle, but these things can have widespread impacts. So the first question I asked when I started working on these habitats, sorry, working on these questions, is do foraging seabirds use these habitats? So simply, are we finding more seabirds in, area, in, in particular habitats based on their physical properties? But also, why do they use these habitats? So what is it about these features that attract seabirds? So this was the start of my PhD. So this is the first project I did. Uh, this was in Orkney in, in northern Scotland, shown by the red square here. And you'll see Orkney is, is a, a very... Uh, it's got a large um, number of islands, quite complex coastlines. It's also characterised by quite fast currents. So... We worked in the site called the Fall of Wallace, shown here. Uh, and this is the one that I showed you in the picture earlier on. This is the one that's got those very prominent shear lines, very strong currents, uh, and quite a complex um, environment. And what we did here is we did a few boat surveys, simply counting when and where birds were, were, were found. So we did a um, zigzag going up that main channel. Um, and the four birds that we looked at, because they were the most prominent, were Puffin, Guillemot, Black Guillemot, and European Shag. And all these birds are, are characterised by the fact they are pursuit divers. So they, they feed by, by diving through the um, water column, typically feeding sort of mid, mid water or actually on the seabed. So the black guillemots and the European shags will feed on the seabed. So we um, combined our observations of, of seabirds with some information on the currents. And these are some um, FVCOM outputs, which were were provided by colleagues at PML. So this is Pierre uh, Casanavi. Um, and this just put into, into numbers what we saw during the survey. So uh, the top one shows the, um, the horizontal current speed. So again, you see this, this huge variety from the sort of slack water in, in the wake of the, of the islands to the very fast currents on, down the central channel. This here is, is a uh, measure of turbulence. And this is picking out these very prominent shear lines, again, which I've talked about early on. So um, off the head of the islands. And this is the um, vertical um, current speed. This is showing those, those, those slopes where water's being forced up or cascading over. So the, the blue shows where water is actually being forced down and red shows where water's being forced up. So this uh, sort of captured the uh, physical complexity of the site, which we were then able to link to our seabird observations. What we found, quite simply, is birds were using quite distinct areas. So if you look at the puffins here, they were using that main channel. So there's a higher chance of seeing a puffin where current speeds were high. And they're also using these shear lines here. So this is our, our uh, measure of turbulence. So puffins like to where it's very turbulent on, on the shear lines and also in the main channel. The black guillemots, they tended to, to sit in the um, soil water, but also use these um, shear lines as well. Uh, common guillemots were found in fast water in the main channel. European shag were actually found in areas where there was water being forced down. This is probably where you've, you've got um, tidal currents cascading over those slopes. So in short, the birds were using these features. Um, and interestingly, there was differences in, in use among species, which might be linked to their foraging tactics. Uh, but I'll go on to that in a minute. So uh, the next thing, this is quite recent, but... What we did then is we've started to look at features themselves. So we've looked at the, the site as a whole. We've picked out um, individual habitats, so um, individual features. And now we wanted to look a bit more as to how birds actually use those features um, themselves. So this is some work that I did uh, last year and has now been published um, in uh, Stranford Lock. This is in Northern <coughs> Ireland. And for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on, on the uh, seed in site, which is quite interesting. This is a tide turbine. And what we noticed is that there was um, a very prominent shear line, or very prominent turbulence, sorry, um, 
forming behind this turbine on uh, flood tides. Um, I wanted to see how the, the, the free species of terns, so these are the free species of terns you get in uh, Schleinford Lock, they're mainly arctic terns and common terns. Um, I wanted to see how these birds were, were, were using this feature, so were they actually using this shear line. So this is going into a, a finer scale on those boat surveys we did uh, in, in Orkney. And what we did is we took a um, ADCP out into the uh, wake of that turbine. And you'll see here that so, so this is upstream, so this is downstream of the turbine. So upstream of the turbine, this is downstream. And this is showing the um, uh, current strength. So you'll see that in the wake of the turbine, so to behind it, you've got this very, very um, obvious decline in our current speed, shown with the blue here. You've also got this real increase in turbulence. So, this is picking out that feature very clearly. So on flood sides, there's the strong turbulence and decreased current speeds in the wake of that turbine. And from our um, shore-based observation of turns, we found that, that the, the turns were using this, this area. So th this is to the south of the turbine, this is to the north. And you'll see that when that shear line, uh, so um, when that turbulence was present in the wake of the turbine, We've got a huge increase in the probability of seeing turns. They're almost never there on the, on the ebb tide. And, we, and when we saw turns, they were, they were in big numbers. So when this, this area of turbulence, turbulence um, that was present, there was more turns there, and they were in higher, sorry, there's more chance of seeing turns, and they were there in higher numbers. So a very clear use of, the, of this feature. So in a similar sort of manner, a few years earlier, I had looked at a a natural area of turbulence in the Ford Warner, so this is back to Orkney. And uh, what we did here is we focused on, on the uh, skerries to the north of the site. So again, we, we've got that very prominent shear line um, emerging from those skerries during the, uh, during the flood tide and also during the ebb because you've got these, these small islands here. So on the flood tide, that shear line was, was coming down from the skerries and on the ebb, it was going up from, from those islands there. So this is where we wanted to look at a certain feature and see how birds used it in a bit more detail. Um, so I spent a few weeks on an orc in, in, on, on Edie, which is this small island here. Uh, I made a, a sort of small camp on the headland there. Um, very comfortable, it was, it was some sort of bunker as well. So very, very sheltered. And I simply just watched this very small area for many, many hours over the Ebbflood um, tidal cycle. And the two species we saw here were again black guillemots and European shag. It's a species which feed on the seabed. And this is, again, some um, FVCOM model outputs from, from that site. And you'll see here the sort of natural... Um, so this is high tide here, and this is the height of the tide. So you can see, obviously, it dropped to low tide and back up to high tide. Uh, interestingly here, this is the um, current speed. You'll see here that there's actually a, mis a mismatch between the current speeds and the tidal height. So peak flows here were almost at low tide. And this is quite a um, common feature of these very high flow sites, especially when you've got um, um, high flows in, in small channels. That you get this mismatch between current speed and, and, uh, and height, which you don't normally get. You can see here, this is the, the turbulence, which picks out that, that shear line. And even though it's present on both tidal, tidal states, it tends to peak kind of during the, the ebb. So you've got this, this variation in physics within this particular feature. So even though this feature was there uh, throughout the entire tidal cycle, it, its properties actually did, did vary. And what we found here is the, uh, the birds, again, showed a preference for, for the particular time. So the black guillemots favoured it when uh, currents were lowest and the height was lowest. So they favoured it when, when it was slack tide, but also when it was low tide. And the shags favoured it, um, again, when, when the speeds were lowest. So this, we think, is because these birds are diving through the uh, water column and feeding on the seabed, it might just be too energetically expensive to dive when the currents are fastest and when it's deepest. So if you think about it, they are diving through very fast currents and very turbulent currents. It's going to uh, involve quite a lot of, um, of energy expenditure. So these birds might be choosing to feed in this feature but when the, the cost of feeding there were at their lowest. So to bring all those things uh, together to make a sort of grand conclusion is, think about this as being your coastal um, environment. 
And just here you've got two habitats, habitat one, habitat two. So what we're seeing here is that most birds might aggregate in a certain habitat. So I couldn't find a picture of a, of a diving guillemot, so using a pen instead. <laughs> but it implies that you know, these birds are diving to the seabed. And the, the other ones are perhaps the, the, the terns. So they are using the same feature, generally. But actually when you go in, so this is, this is a um, representation of, of the type of cycle within that habitat. Is you then might, dip, might get differences um, among species as to when they use that habitat. So there's a, a scale dependence as to how birds use these features, and it might be linked to how they feed. So, so the, the terns feeding the surface might favour when it's fastest, because that's when more prey is being brought up to the surface. But the birds feeding on the seabed might forage there more when it's slack tide, so they, it's less energy um, to feed there. So in conclusion, and there's lots of studies showing kind of similar patterns in terms of use of habitats. Yes, they do, but different species tend to use different habitats. And this might be linked to their foraging strategies. Um, there seems to be a scale dependence between different between species and habitats. Uh, so um, birds use habitats, but they might use habitats at different times to each other. Uh, and this may be linked to their foraging behaviour, so whether they're a surface feeder or feeding on, on the seabed. So the next question which, which naturally follows on from this is, well, why do they use these habitats? What's the importance of these habitats for them? And to do this, again, you have to think kind of why they're there. So they're there mainly to feed on prey. So if you're a bird, what is important for you when you're finding prey? The first thing is you want prey to be quite uh, widespread. So you want to be able to um, encounter prey quite frequently. So you want your prey to be quite uh, prevalent. If you are a seabird, um, even if, you, if you, you, you can dive, ideally you want prey to be near the surface. So if prey is near the surface, you have to dive less and it's easier to get to it. And if you're a bird that feeds exclusively on the surface, obviously you need your prey to be right on the sea surface. And finally, you want prey to be dense. So if you find prey, you want there to be quite a lot of prey there. So you've got these three elements of prey availability. You want it to be prevalent, shallow and dense. And obviously, in an ideal environment, you want all three. This would be a perfect scenario for seabirds. You're consistently finding prey, you're finding lots of it, and it's near the sea surface. This is your ideal situation. So to test this idea, we, we did some, some transects in the Prince Madu. This is the uh, Celtic Sea. This is Pembrokeshire, Pembrokeshire here, so this is South Wales. This is the North Devon coast, and that there is uh, Lundy Island. And although this is strictly not coastal, I think it shows this, this idea quite well. So this is a, um, a very prominent tidal front that runs down the central um, Celtic Sea. You've got mixed water to the, to the uh, west and shallow water to the east. And we did some transects in the Prince Maddox through this area. So um, sampling both the, the uh, chestified water, front water, mixed water. Um, and what we did is we, we counted birds like we always do. Um, so this is me pretending to see a bird for photographic purposes. Um, I'm not there, but anyway, so we simply go out and count birds down these transit routes um, and basically count how many we see. Um, and the two species we saw most in this survey were uh, the common gillywort and the Manx shearwater. So both these birds die. So even though the Manx shearwater is well known for um, undertaking very big migrations, so this species will migrate from, from, the, from the UK shores in, in the summer where it breeds right down to uh, Patagonia in the winter. So it's, it's a very efficient flyer. What people don't know about Manx shearwaters as much is they're also very good divers. So these birds can often dive to 30 or 40 metres in search of prey, which is mainly um, sprat and heron. Um, with the common guillemots, they dive to very um, similar depths in search of the same sort of prey. So because of that, we were able to, to look at... Um, we, we used a... Um, EK60, so which is a uh, basically a fish finder, to detect the presence of uh, clupeids. So we had measurements of clupeids, measurements of birds across this, this gradient in, in, um, in water masses. And what we found is that there was actually a trade-off between different measurements of prey availability. So we found that prey was shallower and denser in mixed water, 
but it was more prevalent in stratified water. So that situation that I described a minute ago where you wanted it to be all three didn't actually exist in this, in this um, uh, system. What we did find, though, is that if you combine all of these uh, measurements together into a sort of prey availability index, then the most profitable area to, to feed is actually right on the tidal front. So if this blue area here indicates the position of the tidal front on this um, stratification gradient, and you'll see that the, the, the best place, according to our prey index, is right on this front, and this is where we tend to find the most, most birds feeding. So it suggests that, that birds are, are selecting the, the, the most suitable habitat available to feed. So prey is, is not densest, it's not shallowest, and it's not most prevalent, but in combination, these three were best at the tidal front. So what we did then is, is um, this is um, currently being, being prepped, um, but I wanted to test this idea somewhere else. So this was a project which I started a couple of years, so 2017, so three years ago now, and um, this focused on the, on the North Anglesey coastline. So this is uh, Hollyhead down here, this is Amalek, and this is Red Wolf Bay here. Um, and even though I didn't intend on using this data to, to test this hypothesis, it kind of worked out quite good in the end. So we, we surveyed from, um, from six points along the coastline, uh, from uh, Kemlin Bay here, all the way right around to Wolverham, down here. And what uh, is quite interesting about this area of water is you've got two very distinct water masses. So on the, on the north coast in particular, you've got very strong currents. So I think around Carmel Head down here, they reach almost three metres per second at the surface. But on, the, on this side of Anglesey, you get quite a different water, so the, the currents are a lot slower. But you get very high productivity, possibly fueled by the um, freshwater influence uh, and the nutrient input from the coral estuary. So we suspect that high productivity drives high, high prey biomass. So we're kind of using proxies here a little bit, but with, with high productivity, you should get more prey, but we know that strong currents might increase the availability of prey. So we hypothesize that here you've got prey which is more available, and here you've got prey which is more um, abundant. So according to our index of trade-offs, we would expect this area here, at Point Linus, to be where you get most birds. And this is what we did with these um, indices here. So the, the orange is the current speed. So the higher the current speed, the more we expect prey to be available. And productivity here is the is, um, increases towards the, um, to the east. So the more productivity, we expect to be more, more prey biomass. And this is our index here, this dash line, which picks out that Point Linus should be the most um, profitable place. But what we want to do here is consider the fact that there is seasonal changes in the uh, biomass of prey. So in summer, you're going to get much higher productivity in the winter, which suggests you might get much more um, uh, forage fish. And we looked at two species here, Raisable and Guillemot. Uh, the Raisable is very similar to uh, the Guillemot in terms of how it feeds. Um, so we combine these two because it's quite difficult, as you can tell, to tell these apart um, in the field sometimes. So we, we combine them together because they, they, are, they are quite similar in how they feed. And this is just some pictures of my, my bag and flask travelling around Anglesey, as I did numerous surveys. Uh, I have actually got a slide where I put... So I, I did 300 surveys in two years, not just me, a few of us. And I've got a picture like this from every one of those surveys. So I was going to do a sort of mosaic of pictures, but uh, it's not enough time for that. So what we found is this is the... the, the um, so this red line here is our, is our uh, index, the combination of those two, so availability and biomass. And in summer, we found that the, the peak of, of birds, as we predicted from our index, occurred at Point Lyon. So this, this is the, the mean amount of birds per, per survey, and it peaks at Point Linus, exactly where the index suggests is the most uh, profitable area. So that was a really nice finding. But in winter, what we find is actually the, the peak of abundance tends to be the furthest east, so that's uh, Mulvera. So even though our index works really well in the summer, it seems to be productivity is the main driver of where birds are in the winter. So this could explain that actually when prey is so limited, there's not much prey around, the birds have to feed in areas where it's most um, abundant. But in summer, where there's more prey, 
they focus on the area where it's easiest to catch. So that, that trade-off again between biomass and availability. So to summarise that again, so bring those two things together, this could be the situation in, in the summer. You've got areas where prey is most abundant and areas where prey is prey's most available. So they might not necessarily coincide. And the birds will, will forage at the sort of border of these two areas where it is most profitable. But in the winter, when you've got less prey around, you can't really feed in these areas here because there's not much prey around. So you have to go to where prey is most abundant. And this means that they, they shift their habitat to areas where the prey is, is just there in, in greater numbers. So, in summary, why do they use these habitats? Well, it could be overall foraging gains. It could be a balance between availabilities, how easy it is to catch, and the abundance. So obviously you need both, really. Um, and there could be seasonal switching between habitats based on, on, on a change in the biomass of prey. So, what next? This is what I'm doing uh, or trying to do at the moment, um, is the, uh, the work, particularly in the Celtic Sea, has made me think about this idea of energy landscape. So this is where you, you quantify the habitat, not in terms of its physical characteristics, but actually in terms of its um, um, energetic foraging gains. So obviously you're a bird, you're not really choosing the habitat on whether it's fast or slow or deep or shallow, you're choosing it on how easy it is and how much energy you get from that, from that different habitat. This is an idea that I really want to progress a bit, is this energy landscape idea. So mapping areas in terms of um, energy gains rather than physical properties. And we've also got a project starting in Shetland um, uh, next May, uh, where we're going to look at um, this idea of prey availability for those two birds that you just mentioned. So the two birds which I studied a lot in the PhD, we really want to try and tie down why they use these different habitats. So that's sort of building on this idea of why they're using it as opposed to just are they using it. So that's the first sort of section, probably the, the longest one, because that's where I spent my most time. But I'm now going to go on to talk a bit about sort of my, my new work on the influence of uh, weather patterns. So basically this is split into two, two, um, two concepts. So the, the idea of, of, of um, estuarine plumes, so how they influence birds, and uh, also wind patterns as well. And this, this area of research kind of came to me a bit by accident, which I'll explain in a minute. But... Um, and this has also been, been triggered by me working in, in, in areas outside of the UK. So I've seen different habitats, seen different ecosystems, and uh, I've grown to appreciate that it's not all about tides and uh, topography. But you do get these sort of patterns. So again, apologies to any oceanographers, because this is very simplified. But um, wind patterns can be very influential in the exchange of water masses. So this is a um, upwelling, this is an example of an um, upwelling system where because you get strong um, wind patterns and because of the uh, Coriolis effect, Coriolis effect sorry, is uh, when you get winds in a certain direction, they can drag surface waters away from the coastline. And when they switch, they, they can, and when they switch, they can push surface waters towards the coastline. And in areas where you've got very prominent um, wind um, patterns, and also areas where you, you get quite steep slopes, so you're right on the edge of the um, shelf edge near the coastline, this can result in an exchange of water masses. So this is sort of taken from the, the side, side view. But this is a typical situation. When those winds blow, it pushes that warm water away from the coastline, and this cool saline and nutrient-rich water gets pushed up like that. And then when those winds switch, so, this, so then you get possibly lots of uh, forage fish in the coastline and when those winds switch that water gets pushed back in so you get this exchange of different um, water masses in a upwelling system what you can also get is the influence of wind and um, and rain acting um, in, in uh, acting uh, together so this could be your usual event it's sunny it's dry you get fish aggregating around the edge of the plume um, when it rains, that plume increases. So this is perhaps your uh, um, study site with the, the red uh, star. But if you get a, a strong wind coming in, suddenly that, that area gets impacted by the plume. Obviously, when that wind switches, it goes the other direction. So you get these two different forces acting in combination to determine 
um, the sort of um, the conditions in your st uh, study site. And finally, this is something which I've seen in, in the Azores, um, which unfortunately I can't present today because I'm still working on it. But this is typically the features you get. So you get features that are described are typically where you get two different water masses meeting. Um, when you get increases in wind, you get increased in, in, in um, mixing, and these features then become a lot weaker. Um, and again, unfortunately I can't show it today, but we have shown this effect uh, in some of our work last year. So these obviously are, are processes which are most impacted by environmental change. So changes in wind patterns and changes in uh, precipitation. So this again is something which I'm just going to very briefly go over because it's, I guess it's quite common knowledge. But this is some, some work that shows changes in precipitation uh, over the past 50 years or so. So you see most places are getting more rainfall and particularly in winter, you're getting more intense rainfall. And this on the right is showing some predictions of uh, wind speed and variation in wind speed over the next 40 or 50 years. So even though you'll see on the left hand side this is changing wind uh, wind speed, it's dropping. On the right, you see there's more variation in that wind. So we are going to see some, some changes in the um, patterns of precipitation and also in wind, which obviously can have an impact on these processes which I've just described. So, same questions again. Uh, that should say weather. Um, same thing though. Do, do foraging seabirds respond to weather? And why do they respond to weather? And this is something which I'm only just starting to look into. So, I haven't answered this at all really. But what happened is, and this is sort of the background to why I've started to work on this. So, we went to, to do some work in, uh, in Vigo in Spain. This is on the uh, Atlantic coast of Spain, so in uh, Galicia. Really nice place, as you can see there. And I went there originally because I was interested in how the um, European shags were using the, um, the strong currents around these islands. So I've done work on, on European shags in, in Orkney, West Scotland and here. And I thought this would be a nice way to, to compare how they react to, to tides and topography in Spain as to how they respond to them here. And see if there's any consistencies and patterns. Um, but also what I, this is a massive bit of advice, Always know your study system before you go there. Because I didn't realise that it was an upwelling system, because I was just looking at obviously the islands, there's fast flows, there's shear lines and stuff. But actually, this is an um, upwelling system, and it's really influenced by estuarine plumes. So, to the south of the rear, there's a, a river called the Minho on the Portuguese border. And, because, and it's weird here, because the rear itself, it is an estuary, but it's got a very controlled um, flow because of, of upstream damming. So actually the main influence on the salinity in, in, the, in the Vigo estuary is the estuary further down the coast. So when you get a plume that quite often gets, gets um, forced up in, into the rear and you get quite strong changes in uh, salinity. But me being sort of naive and only thinking about tides, I didn't know this before we went there. So our main aim when we went here was to look at how the shags were using the, the various features which I described earlier on in the talk. So what we did is we went there and did the same sort of zigzag transect, so very similar, you can probably see, to my first work uh, six years previously in Orkney. We're looking at shags, so again, very similar to what I was doing before. But also we had a, a very big population of uh, yellow-legged gulls, which are uh, very similar to the herring gulls you see around here, but these actually feed on natural prey, which is a shock. Uh, so these feed actually a lot on, on, on red pelagic crabs. Um, so it's red swimming crabs, uh, whilst the shags are mainly feeding on uh, uh, sand drift in this area. But I went there thinking that there's shear lines here, there's a slope here. I'm, I'm going to see how these birds respond to these various features. But what happened actually, halfway through the survey, is we got an intrusion of what's called the West Iberian Buoyant Plume. And when I gave this talk in Vigo last year, they were impressed that I knew that, because it's quite a, a local process. Um, but here's the, uh, the estuary here, and you'll see at the start of our survey so that there's a, a plume of event. And over the course of, of, the, of the week, that plume got forced up into the estuary, um, peaking on the 10th and the 11th. So this is where the salinity was at its lowest, indicating that the plume had reached the uh, Vigo estuary. And this is when we got our peak bird count. So this is the um, tidal speed over, over the course of the, the week or so. This is the salinity. So you clearly see here, there's a drop in salinity when the plume reaches the estuary. And this is where we got our peak counts of, of, uh, of gulls, but particularly shags. So 
the responses to the intrusion of this plume are much greater than the intrusion to solid conditions. So what we found here is increased abundance during certain events and responses can often exceed those of tides and uh, topography. So this is sort of lesson to me that it's not all about those two things. So this is what we're doing next summer to try and test this. So obviously we've got a really perfect system on our doorstep for looking at these things. So we've got the straits and we've got the um, Cobby Estuary. So a great opportunity to test some of these ideas. So we're going to be t um, tracking shags and, and guillemots next year. We're going to be looking at shags and cormorants in, in the strait. So Claire's doing, Claire's doing that for her projects. And we're also going to analyse some data we've collected from BV on the resource. So I realise that I've massively gone over time, but in summary, interactions between tides and trophy create features which attract seabirds. This is probably explained by enhanced foraging opportunities. Um, it's probably based on prey abundance and availability, but there could be shifts in this because of seasonality and variation in weather. But we must consider these in combination when estimating impacts from, from hard infrastructure, so human developments and climate change. So, lots of people to thank. Uh, Peter's not here, unfortunately, but Peter's been a, a real help since I met him four years ago. Jan obviously has been very important in, in this work with lots of useful ideas, as always. Uh, and it all started with Beth Scott from Sioux Falls and Aberdeen. But lots of collaborators and lots of funders to thank. And uh, I realise I haven't left time for questions, have I? Much? Oh, no, we do have time. All good. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>